sort of uh, making some notes there as the previous speakers have gone through and just uh, thought I might just tell you a little bit about my experiences. Uh, well, I'll take you back, if I may, to 1963 when I was a young fellow, as a schoolboy, I used to wander across Tower Bridge to watch the uh, speaker, the speakers on the, high, uh, on the uh, free speech corner of uh, Tower Hill, speaker's corner there, which uh, uh, Lord Sober used to speak at uh, every lunchtime. And uh, uh, he used to be quite an interesting fellow. I didn't agree with what, most of what he said, but he was an inspiring speaker. Uh, and the concept of free speech then was sort of drilled into me. I couldn't have been more than about 13 or 14. And when I got a little bit older, uh, I went up to Hyde Park Corner to listen to the speakers there. Uh, and what was particularly interesting about the speakers at Hyde Park Corner, uh, they could uh, attract quite big crowds in those days, and they would... Uh, uh, there'll be people from all over the world. There'll be people from all over the world watching the speakers just stand on a box with maybe one, maybe two policemen, no more. And they found it was fascinating. They came from countries where they didn't have free speech. And uh, at Hyde Park Corner in those days, in the late 1960s and early 70s, the whole concept of Speaker's Corner was that you could say exactly what you liked, whatever you liked. As long as you weren't inciting violence, anything went, all right? And people stood awestruck that that could happen, and that could be so, and that was wonderful. Fast forward until uh, just a couple of years ago, when I saw a Christian padre arrested for quoting the Bible. That's how far we have come. That's how far, with moronic policemen standing around, <laughs> arresting him and letting people reading from anything else that they want to do, the Quran, for example, which, funnily enough, says a lot of the same things uh, as the Bible in certain parts, uh, we're, we're allowed to get away with that. Now, if you can't quote the Bible, if, if, if you, in a Christian country, uh, at Hyde Park Corner, I think we've come to a very sorry pass. True. It's a very, very sad thing, in yeah. my view. And uh, the fact that uh, it can happen is because we have a politicised police force. And if you look at what they actually get taught at police, uh, at police college these days, you'll see exactly why that is. Now, a few years ago, I was invited to speak to the, Conser the Cambridge University uh, uh, Conservative Association. And I went there, I gave a speak on libertarianism, in point of fact. Uh, and a year later, I was invited back to speak at their dinner. And the... Uh, theme of the speech after dinner was going to be the government of Lord Salisbury in the 1890s, which Clement Attlee reckoned was the most successful uh, Conservative government that uh, we've ever had. I don't think anybody would possibly suggest that isn't so, especially today. Uh, it was a wonderfully successful government. I thought it was very interesting because if you look at Lord Salisbury's quotation, he was a libertarian, funnily enough. A lot of the stuff he did was very, very libertarian. Uh, and two days before I was due to get there, um, I was deplatformed. It was Robinson College, uh, and they, uh, they, they were very clever. They didn't censor me. They didn't say, Mr. Bloom can't come and speak. Uh, they, they said to the Conservative Association, you have to make sure there's enough security there to defend the students. What they thought I was going to do, <laughs> I really can't say. Um, but they wanted, uh, they said, uh, and of course the, the Conservative Association, they got a, a quotation from G4 or somebody, or Securic or something, whatever it was, and it was four or five thousand pounds which blew it out of the water. But of course the Conservative faculty, uh, the faculty of Robinson College said, oh, we, we, we didn't deplatform Mr. Bloom, we, we, we didn't say he couldn't come. All we said was that the Conservative Association would have to make it secure for our students, and so we asked them to pay for the security. Well, that's as good as cancelling. That's censorship. That's censorship. So I was censored off. It was the same thing when I went to Stirling University uh, in the frozen north, and I went up there to give a, uh, a lecture on how Scotland could be, keep, be, could be comfortably independent if they adopted Austrian school economics. Oh, no, no. No, that's far too tough for the Scots, uh, uh, the Scots up there, so I was deep platform there. We had to find another venue, which, of course, it was a campus university, cut it down by half, cut the audience down by half. Uh, I was deplatformed at Durham University. I can't remember why. Uh, uh, oh, I must tell you this: at Scotland University, I said, "Why did they deplatform me at, uh, at Stirling University?" And do you know what the answer was? We didn't know what he was going to say. <laughs> <laughs>
So I was censored before I opened my golf. Uh, then it was Somerville College when somebody said, uh, who was a libertarian, and said, I'd like Dr. Bloom to come and speak to us. I thought this was top stuff, because it was like turning into White's Club. Now, I'm far too common to get into White's Club. Um, uh, but Somerville's College for not letting me speak there was because I wasn't uh, a proper chap. <laughs> so obviously uh, I'm not a proper chap. Uh, and so uh, there was no reason given at all, I just wasn't allowed to speak there. And so it goes on, you know, the list goes on and on. I've spoken at Cambridge Union, I've spoken at the Oxford Union, that the unions don't, haven't given me a problem. Uh, it's when speaking at the colleges, and it's sometimes started by the faculty, and it's sometimes started um, uh, by uh, the NUS, who get the ball rolling. Now, the motion, let's just have a look at the motion here, because what we're actually looking at, do we have censorship in the UK? And we've talked a lot about government, or some, some of the uh, opposition there, or the proposers have talked about that. Um, uh, it isn't as simple as that, is it? It isn't really as simple as that. It's not, it's not to do with the government. It's to do with the whole deep state machinery. And sometimes the Americans get these state... These the things so right, don't they? Deep state, what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful expression that is, because I think it sums it up for all of us. Deep state. Uh, and they can do, the government can actually pressure in, in a million ways, the establishment can pressure in a million ways. Uh, so, for example, uh, just chucking them around. Um, climate change, for example, uh, as soon as uh, the older members will remember David Bellamy uh, and, uh, uh, and Joe Ball, whatever his name was, I can't remember Paul. Uh, anyway, um, they said, just a minute, no, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has got absolutely nothing to do uh, with the uh, weather or, uh, or, or, or we're all going to boil to death, we're not having it that. They were immediately sacked by the BBC because that was against the, uh, that was against the government uh, rhetoric. So they were got rid of, and instead they brought in a man, uh, Roger Harabin, who was an activist. He's not a scientist, he was, he's just an activist, a green activist, and he's been there almost up until just the last year. So all these little things go together, and then you find Classic FM, if you listen, I used to listen to Classic FM. You would be stunned at how much money they get for the government for those um, government statements. Well, it doesn't matter what it's about, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about getting jabbed, uh, whatever it happens to be, uh, that's a very big budget. So they virtually bought Classic FM, Lock, Stock and Barrel, so they can turn that particular tap off. We don't get anybody uh, who can counter-argument. It has to be, I mean, I've taken down, I've been taken down by Twitter and I've been taken down by Facebook. Because of all the, all the very wealthy oligarchs in the world uh, only need a nudge from government. And of course, all governments are saying the same thing. Uh, you never get a balanced approach. And of course, somebody mentioned the BBC um, Charter. Uh, and the BBC Charter is to inform and entertain. It does neither. It does neither. It's repeat after repeat after repeat, if you look through. It just repeats. Uh, and of course, it doesn't inform. Otherwise, we would have been told that it's not a vaccine. It's experimental spike protein therapy, which is, but don't call it a bloody vaccine. It's not a vaccine. And that word should be got rid of immediately. It should, that should be censored off. Let me censor that word of vaccine. It's not a vaccine. Another word I'd like to censor off, of course, is free. <laughs> free. Oh, we believe in free this and free that, and it's free at the point of delivery, and it's free, free, free. No, let's change that to taxpayer funded, because that's the truth about it. The government doesn't have any money. It's taxpayer funded. So let's have that phrase stopped. So we stop this drip, drip feed all the time of propaganda. Propaganda brings me on to Joseph Goebbels. I decided that it might be a good idea if I looked out and found out how it was done. So I looked at his uh, uh, biography, it was a biography, and uh, his, his basically to paraphrase what he said, first of all, you have to instill fear in the population. You must instill fear. That's, that's primarily the first thing that you do. Then you must have one message. You must have one message. Doesn't matter how absurd it is. You have one message which appeals to emotion. You will get nowhere, Goebbels said, if you try and appeal to fact. Fact is no good. It doesn't motivate humankind. Fact is something that maybe a small percentage of the population, 15 or 20 percent of the population, are interested in. Everybody here tonight is interested in fact. You are one of the 20%. 
Everybody else is not. They are interested in emotion. And this is what drives people, and this is the problem. And this is the problem we have turning it round. If you ask the man on the Clapham omnibus uh, how the uh, war between the Russian Federation started and the Ukraine, they will tell you that Putin woke up one morning with a sore head. He'd been upon the piss the night before. <laughs> he was bored stiff and he thought, I know what I'll do today, write myself up. I'll invade the Ukraine. 80% of the people in this country believe that to be true. 80%. They don't know anything about the history of the Ukraine. They couldn't point to the Ukraine on the map. They couldn't tell you about the history of the Ukraine. They know absolutely nothing about it. Now, I'm not making a case for the Russian Federation. I'm not making a case for anybody. What I'm saying is, shouldn't we have a balance if the BBC is going to inform and entertain? Shouldn't there be a balance? But they closed Russia today down, so we're only hearing one voice. And they closed down Russia, Russia today. And said, oh, well, that's the voice of the Russian government. Well, what's the bloody BBC if that's not the voice of the British government? So we're not getting a balanced thing. So people who were masked, they come their face with masks, some of them still are with the masks all over their face, double jab, quadruple jab, terrified of COVID with a 99.9% recovery rate, totally relaxed about a nuclear war. <laughs> not one of them a nuclear war. Presumably they think it's a 99.9% recovery rate from a nuclear war. <laughs> Or you can have a poster against it. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that we said, we've got to appeal to the emotion. It's got to be drip, drip, drip all the time. It's got to be the same message, and it appeals to the emotion. But, he said, and this is the key thing, the key thing, Goebel said, dissent is not allowed. You're not allowed dissent because the man in the pub who reads the Daily Express He's probably not very bright, but he's, you know, entitled to his point of view. So he sits at the pub and he gets the Daily, Daily Express view, he gets the BBC view on everything, he gets the Sky view on everything, which is the same message all the time. Now, that man could actually listen to somebody articulate putting another, another side of the case, uh, somebody like Piers Corbyn, who I can see lurking over there. Uh, he should be on. Professor Plymer from Australia should be able to be put on to have to have a look at the other side. So you've got people, so uh, people who actually believe there's a climate emergency. Bloody hell, 30 years I've been listening to this. 30 years we've had a climate emergency, but who do we get advocating it? We get the little bloody Swedish doom goblin turning us over. We don't get the scientists, we don't get people who know what they're doing. We get that funny little girl, and we get mad King Ludwig of Bavaria, who's now Charles III. <laughs> I don't know what happens to Charles's head if you're Charles number one. They can knock, knock a couple of things off there, in my view. Um, so, you know, we're just not getting, we're not getting any truth. We're not getting any balance. It's covert censorship. It's censorship by oppression. It's censorship by omission all the time. And, of course, it's not just here. It's in America uh, all the time. I visit America quite a lot. It's just the same there. I was doing a podcast thing with a, a, in Pennsylvania thing the other night, and somebody was complaining uh, uh, on the podcast thing that their daughter had been uh, dragged in on a Monday, this is a, not a state school, this is a private school, uh, to be frightened to death about climate emergency. He's paying money for that. He'd be bloody out homeschooling for me straight away, that would be. Uh, so we're just not getting the balance. We're not getting the balance, and we do bring some of this on ourselves, if you don't mind me suggesting it. We do bring some of this on ourselves, don't we? If you pay the BBC, you are covered. Yes. Right? If you pay, if you haven't cancelled your banker's order and you, have, and you haven't stopped sending your cheque, you are responsible. So if you are anybody in this room, stop it. And if we all stopped it, something will be done. I'll just finish on the note of cognitive dissonance, which is a fascinating thing. I have, my wife is a medic, uh, and she can't understand it either. She did her dissertation to qualify on actually the long-term use of masks, believe it or not, on the face, how dangerous they were. So she's never worn a mask, I've never worn a mask, we don't bother, and incidentally lockdown, when lockdown came along, we built a micro pub on my little small holding in East Yorkshire, and half the village turned up every Friday night, they had complete protection. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't bothered with the jab, we haven't bothered with masks. You said, you 
know, it's up to us, isn't it? <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? <laughs> but there we are. That is what I think we need to do. We need to take it in our own hands. We can't wait for government. We have this WAF, it's, all, it's global. What I want to see, it can start if we take a grip, if the people take a grip, they need to get rid of Mark Rutter in Holland, they need to get rid of Macron, they need to get rid of uh, Trudeau. If these people aren't there, they can't impose WAF strategy upon us. You will, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. At the moment, they're working really hard to make sure you own nothing. I don't think we're going to be happy. <laughs>